Okay, I'm now pleased to introduce Scott, Dr. Scott Edwards from Harvard University, who is the chair of the selection committee for the Stephen Jay Gould Award. Scott. Thank you very much. I speak to you as a member of the Education Committee of the Society for the Study of Evolution. And before I begin, I'd like to thank the other members of the Stephen Jay Gould Award Prize Committee, which consisted of myself as chair, Sam Shiner, Lacey Knowles, Mohammed Noor, and I'd also like to thank Rob Pennick for his help in putting this together. <clears throat> So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Eugenie Scott uh, as the recipient of this first Stephen Jay Gould uh, Prize awarded by the Society for the Study of Evolution. The Stephen Jay Gould Prize is award will be awarded annually, this is the first one, by the Society to recognize individuals whose sustained and exemplary efforts have advanced public understanding of evolutionary science and its importance in biology, education, and everyday life in the spirit of Stephen Jay Gould. Although this first award, we're recognizing Dr. Scott's public outreach uh, and impact in the wider realm of society, it's important for society members to know that this award is uh, equally open to academics as well as uh, public educators. Uh, other sorts of people working in society, whomever has a broad impact. And I'd also like to point out that at the council meeting this afternoon, the society um, agreed to continue the award, which is good news, and they also, uh, in lieu of establishing an endowment for it, they're uh, requesting that, you know, that people contribute to the, the prize uh, as part of their registration in upcoming meetings. It's a prize that we can all be proud of as members of the society. <clears throat> okay, so the, the winner this year is Eugenie C. Scott. Uh, Dr. Scott received her PhD from the University of Missouri and in physical anthropology, and she taught at the university level for a number of years. <clears throat> in short, Dr. Scott has devoted her life to advancing public understanding of evolution. The National Center for Science Education was founded in the early 1980s, and Dr. Scott has been its unflagging director since 1987. As the executive director, she has been on the forefront of battles to ensure that public education clearly distinguishes science from non-science, and that the principles of evolution are taught in all biology courses. She has served on the boards of many organizations, such as the Biological Sciences Curriculum Study, and as a consultant to organizations from the National Academy of Sciences to WGBH NOVA to the Mississippi Department of Education. In these efforts, she has been an important leader in the public sphere, molding and focusing the efforts of scientists, educators, lay people, religious groups, skeptics, agnostics, believers, scholars, and ordinary citizens through firm but gentle guidance. <clears throat> Dr. Scott has received six honorary degrees, and her efforts have been acknowledged not only by evolutionists such as ourselves, but by practitioners of many different sciences, including geology, ecology, and most importantly, by non-scientific groups, such as educational groups, a uh, simple testament to the enormous impact she has had across the sciences and across the uh, <clears throat> platforms that allow science to impact the public. She is a gifted communicator and public intellectual. She is a frequent guest on radio television shows and an eloquent spokesman for, spokesperson, spokeswoman for science. <laughs> Her writings have illuminated the process of science to thousands, perhaps millions, and her books have exposed the efforts of many groups in our society to hobble and undermine the teaching of science to our younger generation. The organization that she has nurtured far transcends the considerable reach of her own voice, vastly amplifying her impact on public understanding. For these many reasons, it is extremely appropriate that Dr. Scott be the first recipient of the Stephen Jay Gould Award. 
<clears throat> and I'd like her to come up so I can present her with not only a plaque, but a check from the society for $5,000. And that will encourage many of you to uh, grow up and have as much impact as she has had. <clears throat> I'll just read, uh, read the plaque. It says, uh, the 2009 Stephen J. Gould Prize awarded by the Society for the Study of Evolution to Eugenie C. Scott in recognition of her tireless, tireless efforts on behalf of public understanding of evolution and its importance in biology, education, and everyday life in the spirit of C Stephen J. Gould, signed by myself as chair of the committee and by Craig Moritz, president of the Society of Study of Evolution. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is really a, a, a wonderful uh, experience. Uh, I'm a member of SSE, attended meetings in the past, and it's, it's great to see so many friends, and it's, it's particularly nice to have my friends give me this wonderful award. This is a huge honor to be the first Stephen Jay Gould Award winner. Steve was an early and consistent supporter of the National Center for Science Education, almost from day one and was very generous with his time in, in attending our conferences and presenting uh, talks for us and, and helping to publicize our efforts, especially when we were very small uh, those many, many years ago. <clears throat> One of the last pictures of Steve was taken at the AIBS meetings in March of 2002, where he received the Distinguished Scientist Award. John Moore is standing uh, talking to him. Uh, he died two months later. And uh, it was uh, quite a surprise to many of us to discover at that meeting that he had this inoperable brain cancer. I'm extremely pleased to be the possessor of a Stephen Jay Gould baseball card, which not very many people can claim. This is truly a collector's item. Everybody knows his enthusiasm for baseball, of course. But you know, in all seriousness, um, we lost a wonderful communicator of science in Steve Gould. We lost a wonderful communicator of science in Carl Sagan, both men taken from us uh, before their time, uh, as men with still many good years of, of science and communication uh, in them. But don't despair. We do have very good science communicators and people who care about the public understanding of science. Your award, uh, which will go on uh, after this year, I'm very pleased to hear, has many, many uh, potentially uh, um, praiseworthy candidates uh, to whom you can, you can extend this honor. Um, the astronomers have Neil deGrasse Tyson and Lawrence Krauss. Uh, we in biology have uh, excellent communicators in um, Sean, Carl, uh, Sean Carroll. There's also a physicist, Sean Carroll, but you know the Sean Carroll I'm, I'm talking about. Um, Kevin Padian, Neil Shubin, um, Massimo Piliucci. There's wonderful people who have taken a special effort to try to help our public understand science and especially our science of evolution. But we'll miss Steve. There's no question about that. Well, you all know the statistics. Uh, the United States certainly has a problem with evolution being accepted by the public. In this paper by Miller and colleagues published a couple years ago in Science, a very simple question was asked of recipients, adult Americans and citizens from uh, 23 other countries around the world. Humans evolve from earlier forms of animal, true or false? And to blow up that chart, which so many of you have seen, I understand that it's the most uh, frequently requested illustration from Science Magazine in the last three years. So you don't go blind trying to read this. We beat Turkey. <clears throat> we perhaps would aspire to a higher degree of science literacy in our field. Now clearly, the public understanding of science and the way we scientists look at evolution uh, is quite striking. A number of years ago, uh, the questions which Gallup 
asks periodically of adult Americans about evolution and creation, were asked to a group of scientists, a group of uh, uh, members of the organization American Men and Women of Science. Uh, this was not a really great survey for a number of reasons, but it, it is the only uh, evident, the only data I know where the same questions were asked of the general public and of scientists at the, approximately the same time. And as this newspaper clipping from the Washington Times shows, um, scientists, when asked, man was created pretty much in his current form at one time in the past 10,000 years, differ strikingly from the general public in terms of their agreement with this statement. Approximately the same time that scientists were reporting 5% agreement with this statement, the general public reports in the high 40%. Another question that Gallup asks, which was asked to, of the scientists, man evolved over millions of years from less developed forms of life. God had no part in the process. General public, 9%. Scientists, 55%. Clearly, the um, percentage of scientists who believe that evolution occurred and God had nothing to do with it is substantially higher than that of the general public. But Gallup also asks the third question, and I think it's very revealing to look at uh, the um, results of this third question's uh, answer, because the public looks at questions like this one up on top, and there's this pervasive idea that all scientists are atheists. When asked, man evolved over millions of years from less developed forms of life, but God guided the process, the same percentage of scientists answered yes to that as the general public. So scientists, I think the takeaway from these data is that scientists overwhelmingly accept evolution. I suspect that 5% was people didn't read the question right. Uh, scientists overwhelmingly accept evolution, and by no means is it accurate to describe scientists as all being atheists. Although fewer scientists are theists, fewer scientists believe in God than the general public. That Other data support that as well. Science teachers also differ from the general public in their acceptance of, of evolution, although not to the same degree as you find scientists. Berkman et al. Publishing, publishing in PLOS Biology 2008 asked the Gallup questions to high school biology teachers and compared them to the same uh, questions asked of the general public at approximately the same time. God created human beings pretty much in their present form at one time within the past 10,000 years. 16% of practicing high school biology teachers answered yes to that, which is substantially less than the general public, but obviously not at the same uh, rate of, of rejection of that idea that you find among scientists. Uh, God had no part in this process, uh, a higher percentage of science teachers, less than that of scientists. And for the uh, theistic evolution question, God guided the process of evolution, a substantial percentage of practicing science teachers fall into that camp. Again, acceptance of evolution among science teachers is much higher than that of the general public. So this is a good thing. Now, today, uh, my talk today is, is uh, a tough one in some respects because, you know, I, I kind of realized after I sent in the abstract, well, this is also a public lecture. So we will have not just fellow scientists here, but we will also have members of the general public. And so I need to, I need to come up with topics that will be of interest to both groups and obviously not go into too much detail, uh, but obviously make it useful to my colleagues as well. So I want to talk about teaching evolution, and I want to talk about the difficulty that both our students as well as members of the general public have with understanding and accepting this idea of evolution. Clearly, general public is, uh, is, is rather rejecting of, of our basic concept of, of, our, of our field and how to do this in a way that's accessible to members of the general public uh, who will be watching this on your website as well and still find it useful to you. So hopefully I will have struck a balance between these two uh, needs and, and we'll come up with something that you will find useful. But the, ba the, ba the basic idea is indeed, keep it simple, stupid. Um, the basic idea of, of what I want to talk about is that in general, we, we tend not to present evolution in a basic enough fashion 
that our students and the general public can actually grasp what it is are the important elements of our, of our science. Um, there's lots of filigrees that you can get into, clearly, when you're talking about uh, the details of evolution. But what I have found in dealing with this issue over 20 plus years as director of NCSE and more years than that as a, as a professor and, and a teacher, um, people don't get the basics. So my suggestion to you, and what I want to talk about in the rest of this lecture, is keep it simple. How do we get the big ideas of evolution across in a way that doesn't um, mislead our audience and in a way that prepares them, whether it's the student audience or the general public, prepares them for maybe additional study and learning even more about this science that we find so exciting. So here's what I'm basically going to talk about. Teaching science as a way of knowing better. Teaching, I, I want to make some comments about how we teach evolution. And I want to make some comments about what we teach when we teach evolution. First of all, I want to start out with some comments about science as a way of knowing, philosophy of science, if you will. Uh, because not only is evolution poorly understood by our fellow citizens, each of which, by the way, has one vote, just like you, um, but also the nature of science is very poorly understood by our fellow citizens. Um, this cartoon says it all. Scientists confirm today that everything we know about the structure of the universe is wrongity wrong wrong. Um, an awful lot of members of the subject think this is so. Well, here's a new scientific discovery. Well, this changes everything we've ever known about science, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But that's not actually how science really works. We don't change everything. Yes, it is true that our explanations change, and that's actually a strength of science. We all know that. But it's very easy for the public to misunderstand what that actually means. I suggest it's very useful to present science to our students and to members of the public as being a series of concentric circles, if you will. There are core ideas of science that have been very well tested. They are major theories. They are major explanations. And frankly, we're not continuing to test them anymore. We use these core ideas of science to build understandings about the natural world in many ways. Heliocentrism is here to stay. Okay? Astronomers are not really debating whether the planets go around the sun. Um, heliocentrism is a well-accepted astronomical concept. Uh, cell theory, atomic theory, Big Bang theory, or uh, um, inflationary theory, uh, and evolution are all core ideas of science. Around the core ideas of science are the frontier ideas of science. That's what's going on at this meeting. That's what's going on in the journals of, that scientists produce and the work that you're doing in your laboratories and in the field. The frontier ideas of science are where we're really testing new ideas and, and seeing what ideas fit with the core ideas and which, what ideas are stimulated by core ideas that we want to go out and test. Some of these frontier ideas will go into the core. Many, let's face it, most of the things that we work on aren't going to work out. Uh, you hit a whole lot more dry wells than ones that, that, that actually gush. Some of those frontier ideas will end up out on the fringe, because that's kind of the nature of the scientific uh, process. Fringe ideas are that third concentric cir circle. Fringe ideas are ideas that scientists really aren't spending any time on. They're ideas that, that in some way conflict with the core ideas of science, and so the probability that these ideas are actually going to lead to something useful in our understanding of the natural world is very low. So scientists really aren't doing much with the, fr the fringe ideas. Things like ESP, telekinesis, um, a variety of ideas that most of us would consider pseudoscience. Intelligent design is a fringe idea of science. Uh, scientists are not spending much time on it because it's, the, the basic ideas are in conflict with core ideas of science. Now, in, in uh, favor of intelligent design and other fringe ideas, it is possible for fringe ideas to become frontier ideas to become core ideas. And a classic example from geology is plate tectonics. 
The idea of continental drift when I was an undergraduate back in the early, uh, in the mid 60s, was a fringe idea of science. Um, most, certainly the geologists at the school that I was going to uh, just sort of waved it away. Well, it's, it's, it's out there. It's not something that anybody really held. Well, within a decade. Uh, Seafloor spreading was, was uh, discovered, a mechanism for how the, planet, uh, how the continents could slide around on the shelves was understood pretty well. And the idea of continental drift and plate tectonics became a frontier idea of science and ultimately it is a core idea of science. So intelligent design aficionados, do the work. Uh, if you want to become legitimate science, the burden of proof is upon you to show that you have something that helps us understand the natural world. But if we, help, if we help our students understand that science, the content of science is sort of this three concentric circles, the core, the frontier, and the fringe, I think we will do a lot to help them understand this balance that we have in science between science changes. Of course our ideas, our explanations in science change. But at the same time, science is reliable. Science is a way of knowing that really pays off in helping us understand how the natural world works. And you can trust it, even if, even if the newspaper headlines talk fairly frequently about new developments in science. That doesn't mean that you can't trust it. That doesn't mean that everything is up for grabs. So how does evolution fit into this? This brings up another point that I'd like to suggest as a way of as, as a suggestion to you for how you present the big ideas of evolution itself. Now think about evolution. Evolution really is a three-part idea. The big idea of evolution is common ancestry, what Darwin called descent with modification. Living things share common ancestors. We study common ancestor, we study this, this uh, descent with modification through the mechanisms or processes which bring it about, obviously natural selection is supremely important in this, but there are other factors that also uh, affect how evolution works. We also study common ancestry, we also study the big idea of evolution through the patterns of evolution. How does the tree of life branch through time? Now if you remember your history, um, when Darwin wrote on the origin of species, he made two of these points, basically. He talked about the big idea of common ancestry and the mechanism of natural selection. He didn't know very much about the patterns of evolution, so he didn't talk very much at all about, about that. But he did hit very strongly on the big idea and the process. And if you remember, Darwin was much more persuasive to his um, fellow citizens, the educated uh, population in, um, in Great Britain and eventually the continent and the North America and North, the New World as well, he was much more persuasive about common ancestry, about evolution itself. It, he, was not as, he was not able to persuade very many of his colleagues that natural selection, as he felt, was the main engine of evolutionary change. It really wasn't until the 20th century and the discovery of more about how things are inherited, Mendelian genetics, that the idea of natural selection really took its place as Darwin wanted it to uh, have its place as the, the key uh, engine of evolutionary change. So really, the big idea of evolution and the processes of evolution are really conceptually different. Uh, they're, they're different categories. The data and uh, inferences that we use to make that inference of common ancestry are very different from the kinds of data and tests that we use to conclude that natural selection is a very important mechanism. Similarly, when we talk about the pattern of evolution, when we talk about uh, the tree of life and our dinosaurs descended from birds and do bears and dogs have a common ancestor and so forth. When we talk about the pattern of change, we use different kinds of data to come up with those conclusions than we do to come up with conclusions about process. So big idea, pattern, and process are really three independent ways of looking at evolution and, can, and are studied uh, in general uh, by different people. Um, and they really are independent because if birds evolve from dinosaurs, it doesn't matter whether natural selection produced it or not. The mechanism is unimportant. You make that inference about birds being descended from dinosaurs based upon a different suite of information. 
So it's very useful to think of evolution and to teach evolution as this three-part idea. Number one, it's more accurate. Uh, it is more conceptually sound. But it also has a, a useful spin-off in that you can you can help people understand the, the sort of this, this three concentric nature of science idea as well. If we look at that idea, the big idea of evolution is a core idea of science. That creatures descended with modification from common ancestors is not something that scientists are debating. We accept that. The pattern and process are the frontier areas of science. This is where the research is going on. We are changing our mind a lot about things in these two categories. This is a useful way to help people understand evolution because so much of the misunderstanding of evolution, alas, proposed primarily by creationists and with great success by creationists, is to look at the disagreements among scientists about pattern and process, about the frontier, the real research that goes on and act as if those disagreements challenge the big idea of evolution, challenge common ancestry itself. This is, not, this is just not good science. This is not good public understanding of science either. And one way of helping our students and helping the general public understand how solid the big idea of science is, is to recognize that, yeah, we're going to change our ideas a whole lot. We're going to change our pattern and process explanations a lot. But we're not really arguing about whether living things descended with modification from common ancestors. So that is my first suggestion to you. My second suggestion, also having to do with the nature of science, is one that I want to spend a little bit of time on because I think it is really important if we're going to help the public understand evolution. By the way, how is the sound system here? Um, I'm getting an echo, but I don't know whether you are. are is, can you hear me OK? OK, good. Well, I don't care if I'm getting an echo. What matters is whether you can hear it. I want to encourage you to distinguish between science as a methodology for understanding the natural world and science as and the philosophical views that may be derived from science but which are not in themselves science. Let me give you some for instances. I'm going to present to you some philosophical views. Okay? Now, those of you who have heard my PowerPoint rant will be very surprised here because I'm actually going to show you a bunch of slides that have text on them, and I hate slides with text. So I'm doing something, you know, don't do as I do, do as I say. But I, I want to show you a bunch of quotations, and there's no other way to do it. But I've tried to keep the quotes short. Here's one that everybody's very familiar with. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. With which, by the way, I agree from a philosophical standpoint. Very different point of view is brought by William Dembski. The world is a mirror representing divine life. Those are two very different points of view. Here's a point of view from another Christian. If Darwinism is true, Christian metaphysics is fantasy. A Catholic theologian, Jack Haught, who was a witness for us at uh, Kitzmiller versus Dover and did a spectacular job on the stand, a fellow Christian to Bill Dembski, has a very different point of view. Nothing in theology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Here's a longer quote, and I apologize for its length, but it's a very striking quotation. Evolution is a general postulate to which all theories, all hypotheses, all systems must henceforth bow and which they must satisfy in order to be thinkable and true. Evolution illuminates all facts, a trajectory which all lines of thought must follow. The Jesuit theologian Teilhard de Chardin. Another Christian point of view. Any view of science that leaves Christ out of the picture must be seen as fun fundamentally deficient. Now. These are all a series of philosophical slash religious views, some by theists, some by atheists, some by scientists, some by theologians. 
it, when I was putting this together, I, I was struck by the huge variety of views out there about science, about evolution, about meaning, about reality, and so forth. These views are very contradictory. They are all philosophical views. None of them are scientific views, I would argue. Let me tell you what I think science is, and I think this will be clear. Some people are surprised when they hear me describe science as a limited way of knowing. Now, science kind of has this, this reputation in American society as this hegemonic, you know, science over all us. Science is going to solve all of our problems. Science is, there. well, you know, science is, in my opinion, and that of many philosophers of science, science is a limited way of knowing. It's got two limitations. The first limitation is we are limited to explaining the natural world. We cannot explain the supernatural world, if there is a supernatural. It is outside of science's job description, shall we say. And I would suggest that the reason for that is that the nature of science precludes it. Think about the basic idea of science. I mean, like I say, keep it simple, stupid. There's lots of filigrees. You can go on with falsification and various flavors thereof. But think about what you'd want a seven-year-old to know about science. The big idea of science is that we have explanations of the natural world, and we test them. Okay? We test our explanations. We test our explanations by going out to the natural world and seeing what works and what doesn't. How do we test scientific explanations. Well, we have to hold constant some variables, and everybody is quite used to this. If I have two plots of corn, and I want to know whether putting fertilizer on one makes a difference, I have to hold constant things like rainfall and sunlight and weeds and cultivation. I can guarantee that the fertilized plot of corn is going to grow better. All I have to do is not water the other one, right? So, but, you know, that wouldn't be a very fair test. So, we have to hold constant variables that we're not interested in if we really want to test our explanation. Notice, by the way, another little nomenclature thing, I don't use the word experiment when I'm dealing with the general public because, <laughs> a point I'll be making over and over, what they hear is more important than what you say. Anybody who's taught understands that. When people hear the word experiment, they think some guy sitting in a, you know, in a laboratory pouring things from one beaker to another. They don't recognize that somebody out in a field, you know, collecting beetles is also, may also be doing an experiment. Um, so I like to use the word test because it kind of doesn't have that laboratory baggage. But anyway, so we're talking about testing our explanations. We test our explanations by holding constant certain variables. That's kind of the real minimum of science. I think everybody, every scientist would agree that that's kind of the basic the basic process that, would, that goes, goes along. Now let's think about this for a sec. If we have to hold constant variables in order to test an explanation, that means we can't bring God into the explanation because we can't hold constant God's effort. God, please make the fertilized plot of corn grow taller. Well, good luck compelling God to do so. One of the nice things about omnipotence is that it's unconstrained, right? Uh, if, as most religious people believe, God is omnipotent, you cannot constrain God, you can't keep him out of the corn plot, you can't keep him out of the test tube, uh, you can't put him into one either. Um, you can't test explanations having to do with an omnipotent force. So you just set them aside. You limit yourself to just using natural explanations. Um, we also limit ourselves to explaining just the natural world rather than the um, supernatural world, rather than uh, things of ethics and morals, if you will. You know, there was, a, um, there was an interesting uh, article in the newspaper uh, a week or so ago, a uh, very tragic and you know, very difficult uh, story of a mother who had a boy, I think he was about 11 or 12 years old, and she actually uh, took him out of state. She hid him so that he wouldn't have to uh, undergo uh, cancer therapy, which she did not believe in. That is a very tough issue. Does the mother have the right to decide what kind of medical treatment her minor child should have? Um, does she have the right to uh, keep treatment that other people in society believe is appropriate for that child's condition, 
what if they're wrong? Um, you know, it, it's, it's, I would suggest that science could help us make that decision. Uh, what's the scientific evidence that the treatment for cancer that was being prescribed for the boy really would work? What's the probability of success, et cetera? But the ultimate question of does she have the right to um, deny treatment to her child, or does the state have the right to force, to compel her to, to let the child be treated? That's not a scientific issue. That is an issue of politics, of society, of culture a culture that values uh, individual decision-making more than collective decision-making. There's lots of things that go into this that are just outside of science. Although I would hope that science would be used to help her and society make that decision. But it's not ultimately a scientific question. So we limit ourselves in science to explaining the natural world and we limit ourselves to using natural processes. What I've been talking about is something called methodological naturalism or methodological materialism. As a methodology in science, we restrict ourselves to material causes, to causes of matter and energy. There is also something called philosophical materialism or philosophical naturalism, which is the idea that natural causes is all there are. Uh, there is no supernatural, there's no God, there's no ancestor spirits, there's no gods. Uh, there's only matter and energy composing the universe, and all cause is of matter and energy. A philosophical point of view that I happen to share with um, some scientists. But these are not the same. There's a difference between natural explanation as a methodology which all scientists use, whether they are theists or whether they are not believers, and a philosophical view that may be highly informed by science, but which is independent of science itself. Let me try to put this in a slightly different way. Uh, not that I wish to be um, uh, controversial at all, but if Henry Morris, who is the author of Creation Science uh, from the 1960s until his death in the early 2000s, uh, a very, very important person in this movement, Henry Morris would say that science proves creation science. Science proves the literal um, uh, creation story of Genesis. Um, well, at that point, he is making some fact claims. If he says that science proves that Grand Canyon was laid down by Noah's flood and cut catastrophically, we can talk. He is making a fact claim, and I can bring science in to say the science does not support this, because he is making a scientific claim. Now, although Henry Morris never said this, some creation scientists have said, well, okay, the Grand Canyon looks like it looks, but, you know, and it doesn't look like it was laid down by, totally by sedimentary deposits, but God just made it look that way. Now, at that point, you have gone outside of science to make a claim that can't be tested through science. So I don't have a conversation with you anymore. But I tell you, a lot of theologians would have a conversation with that. Because basically, he's made a theological argument that many Christians, uh, mainstream Christians, would disagree with. And let's let them fight it out. That's not a scientific issue. I will let them argue with the idea of God you know, stacking the deck, so to speak, to make it just look like um, uh, science didn't happen. So if fact claims are made by creationists, they can be tested with science. But the basic idea of creationism that God specially created is not something that can be tested through science. Now, I believe that if Henry Morris says that science requires you to take his conclusion, that he is making an error from a philosophy of science standpoint. Because I think that methodological naturalism requires us to limit ourselves only to natural explanations explaining the natural world. Well, sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander or other metaphors. If Richard Dawkins says that science supports uh, the idea that there is no God, that's fine too. He is making another philosophical uh, argument. And frankly, the arguments between theists and atheists have gone on for a long time. They are going on now. They will continue to go on, I'm sure of it. Where I think either Richard, although Richard doesn't, but he's the best known, so I'm using him, where either Dawkins or Henry Morris go astray, I believe, is if they believe that science compels their particular 
philosophical slash religious point of view. At that point, you are going beyond what you can say from science itself. I would like to have this argument of theism and atheism take place above the line, so to speak. These are philosophical and religious arguments. There's arguments on both sides. Go to it, have a good time. But don't, and this is more than a nuance, I think it's very important in terms of the public understanding of evolution and the public understanding of science. It's important that we distinguish between what science can and cannot do. And science does not compel either a theistic or an atheistic point of view, in my opinion. And I'm happy to say that there are philosophers of science who do agree with me. And frankly, just from a strategy standpoint, science is too important to be dragged into the culture wars. We need science as an important way of making our society work better, of, of finding those new medical and uh, um, uh, agricultural and other discoveries that will keep our society and, and protect the planet as well. And I'm very happy to say that on the subject of whether science compels certain uh, moral or ethical conclusions, that my friend Richard Dawkins and I will agree. When you ask me whether science tells you how to be moral, I don't think science per se does. But the scientific way of thinking and reasoning can be deployed in moral reasoning. Science can't tell you what's right or wrong, but it can help you think more clearly in your reasoning about what's right or wrong. And that is a position that I uh, support. All right, another point that I want to make about, um, in, in this case, about how we teach um, uh, um, evolution, watch your language. Actually, this is a very funny picture to anybody who um, works at NCSE because Phil Spieth, a uh, retired geneticist from UC Berkeley, is our business manager, and he is a very jolly fellow. He, was, he must have been thinking about Philip Johnson at that point. I'm not sure. He's looking quite stern. But watch your language. Have you noticed how some of your colleagues, certainly not you, because you're much too sensible for that, I'm sure. But have you noticed how some of your colleagues will come in with a uh, grandstanding, um, I had to change all of my notes this semester. I just threw them into the trash because everything in my field has changed. Yeah, sure. Um, again, this is, this is contributing this, to this idea that the public has that everything in science is up for grabs. It's not a, a reliable point of view. But we really have to be careful about how we communicate about science. Let me give you a particularly bad example. Yep, Ida, the, the beautiful little fossil that was um, uh, made, uh, it was discovered 20 years ago, but it was made uh, public, uh, named after the discoverer's uh, little daughter. Uh, Ida is a beautiful fossil. She is quite, quite, quite wonderful, but the hype about Ida was just awful. Uh, and this fossil rewrites our understanding of the evolution of primates. No, it doesn't. I, I, you know, I confess that physical anthropologists have been really derelict in this. And, and I, I would like to throttle all of my colleagues who have over the years said, this changes everything we've known about human evolution. Of course, that's wrong, you know. Um, if you find a new uh, uh, Pleistocene hominid, that doesn't change anything we know about the relationship between Neanderthals and, and uh, anatomically modern. If you find a new Homo erectus, that doesn't change anything that we know about the Pleistocene man apes. I mean, there's just all sorts of things wrong with hyping science. And don't even get me started on this one. It wasn't that the article in New Science Scientist was that bad. The article, of course, was on horizontal gene transfer. And it was a fairly interesting article, although it was a little breathless, but whatever. And, you know, it was discussing some interesting science. There are um, people for Doolittle and others who are working with prokaryotes uh, and eukarya. Uh, who believe that there's been so much horizontal gene transfer among these single-celled organisms, members of the public, we're talking about single-celled organisms here, that finding the universal, the last universal common ancestor, L-U-C-A or LUCA, uh, is, would be impossible. There might have been one, but the, the, the tree of life at its root is a banyan tree with, with roots interlocking and there's all this gene swapping going on. On the other hand, you get into eukaryotes, and you especially get into multicellular organism, you got trees. They all agree with that. 
The tree of life is not as tidy as Darwin thought it was, but Darwin wasn't wrong. What did Darwin know about genes and sequences and DNA? He couldn't be wrong. This was a part of science that was completely irrelevant to him. This is just a terrible, terrible job of communicating science to the public. You know, cutting down the tree of life, this caused us a great deal of damage us being members of the scientific community who were concerned about the public understanding of science. This was published on January 24th. On January 26th, the Texas Board of Education met, and members of the Texas Board of Education held aloft that article as evidence that Darwin was wrong, that evolution was on the skids. Common ancestry is being given up upon by scientists. Therefore, in the Texas Science Education Standards and in the textbooks that will be written to match them, we have to include the weaknesses of evolution. We have to include the evidence against evolution. Thanks a lot, new scientist. You're a big help. Those of you who are journalists, if you want to have, uh, I understand you want to get people to pick up your publications, you, you, want to be, you want to be splashy, you want to get people's attention. There's a way of doing it. A few years ago, the National Geographic published this co cover. Was Darwin wrong? Well, that's an interesting question. It doesn't answer the question on, this, on the cover, by the way. It asks, was Darwin wrong? And you open the, um, the magazine, and it says no. Thank you. That's a much more responsible way of dealing it. Again, this idea of teaching evolution, uh, teaching science as, a, as a, uh, these three concentric circles, teaching evolution is the three-part idea. The core idea of, sci of evolution, of common ancestry, we're not arguing about that. We are arguing about the, the uh, pattern and process. Another thing in terms of watching your language. Now, lots of times when I talk about this at, when I do a university lecture, and we have members of many different science uh, uh, departments in the audience, I'll ask, do we have any Lyellists here? Or do we have any Kelvinists here? And people start looking at me, well, well, of course, the point being is, why are we calling ourselves Darwinists? Geologists and physicists don't call themselves by their 19th century uh, prominent uh, ancestors, shall we say. Why are we calling ourselves Darwinists? Now, Darwin was a really great scientist. We're celebrating his 200th birthday this year, the 150th anniversary of the writing of On the Origin of Species. Darwin was a remarkable man and a, a very interesting human being. Lots and lots and lots of, lots of reasons for people to know about Darwin, know about his ideas. But you know, the problem with referring to evolutionary biology as Darwinism is that it's very ambiguous. What does Darwinism mean? Does it mean the ideas Darwin had back in uh, the 19, uh, 19 uh, uh, century, the 1800s? Well, that's kind of limiting. Does, uh, sometimes we use it as evolution by natural selection, but sometimes, unfortunately, it's used as a synonym for modern evolutionary biology. And, you know, we might as well be Dobzhanskyists, because in, in many respects, people like Dobzhansky and Mayer had a whole lot more to do with modern evolutionary biology than the guy who got us started. I know, consider that there's all kinds of non-Darwinian ideas out there that we teach about that are going on in the papers and posters that we'll be uh, watching for the next couple of days. Um, we are not Darwinists any more than geologists are Lyellists. And I would really like to encourage us to not refer to evolutionary biology as Darwinism. And there's, number one, because it's wrong. You're, you're seeing a pattern here, don't do it because it's wrong, and then don't do it because it's bad strategy. It's also bad strategy because creationists over the years have associated the name Darwin with evolution. And Darwinism to most people doesn't mean evolution by natural selection. To most people in the public, Darwinism means evolutionary biology, or all of evolution. A very good example of this is in the Intelligent Design Book of Pandas and People, which came out in two editions. And in the, um, between the 1989 edition and the 1993 edition, they went through and very carefully changed the word evolution, evolutionist, to Darwinism, Darwinist. So they would write about how, I actually can't read that right here because it's much too tiny, but you know, evolutionists think that, 
Darwinists think that. Evolutionists believe that. Darwinists believe that. Now, why did they go through and systematically change all the incidents of evolutionist to Darwinist? Because Darwinism is an ism. Isms are ideologies. And science should be free of ideology. Darwinism is an atheistic ideology, they tell the public, which we should keep out of our classrooms. You don't want your children learning ideology in school. You want your children learning good science. So leave that Darwinism stuff out. A Darwinist is a practitioner of Darwinism in a way that a botanist is not a practitioner of botanism. Okay. So try to avoid using the word Darwinism or Darwinist in reference to evolutionary biology. I mean, how many of you went up to your colleagues here and said, hi, you know, I understand you're a herpetologist. I'm a Darwinist. You know, we don't refer to ourselves that way. So let's try to refer to ourselves as evolutionary biologists. It's much more practical. Now, my next point has to do with watching your language as well, and I'm a little nervous about it because this is a lecture that the general public was invited to. And as is common in lectures that I give around the country, there are always creationists who come in. And so I'm a little bit nervous to have to say this before an audience where creationists are probably taping this, but Eugenie Scott confesses she does not believe in evolution. I do not believe in evolution. I don't believe in thermodynamics. I don't believe in heliocentrism. I don't believe in plate tectonics. I don't believe in cell division. I don't believe in atoms. I don't believe in the kinetic theory of matter. I do believe in free speech. I believe in separation of church and state. I believe in taking steps to curb global warming. I believe in a national option for health care insurance. And I believe that my husband is the smartest, funniest, and best-looking man I know. Now, you must know Charlie. <laughs> What's the difference be between these two categories? Well, the difference is that these are opinions. These are not. It is not a matter of opinion whether the earth goes around the sun or the sun goes around the earth, right? It is an opinion whether um, Charlie is as good looking as I think he is. Beliefs are opinions. Okay? We don't believe in science. We don't believe in evolution. But we are members of society, and though nobody would say, do you believe in cell division? Um, nobody would talk about belief in cell division. Somehow we pick up from society this business about belief in evolution. So try very hard to break yourself of the habit, if you have it, like most Americans do, of talking about belief in evolution. You accept evolution, tentatively. It's a pretty good idea so far. But if a better explanation comes along, that'll make for some really interesting research, won't it? Evolution is not a dogma. Evolution is not a belief. It's not something that's unchallenged. But this is how opponents of evolution and opponents of evolution education present it to the public. That we are a bunch of dogmatists who have this ism, this ideology, this belief in evolution. No, it's just a really good science, which changes. And, you know, if a better explanation comes around, that'll be really cool, because it's not a belief. I do make one exception, because this is just such a cool poster. Uh, but, <laughs> all right, let us move along to what we teach, and I'll make some very uh, brief comments. Even people who accept evolution sometimes confuse it with the old medieval idea of the great chain of being with, with which you are probably familiar if you remember your, your history. Remember the great chain of being, you start off with uh, inorganic substances and you go through the higher metals and then you go through uh, uh, mud and then you go up to um, uh, simple-celled organisms once they were discovered and then, of course, the simple invertebrates evolve into the more complicated invertebrates and those evolve into um, simple 
um, vertebrates. Simple vertebrates evolve into more complicated invertebrate, uh, vertebrates. You go from um, amphibians to reptiles to um, mammals. And then, of course, you have lower mammals, and then you have higher mammals. And then, of course, guess who is at the top of the uh, list of, of, of organisms here? The great chain of being was a religious idea promoted in the 1600s and 1700s that was the ladder of life, uh, how God had created the universe uh, leading up and then of course above humans was angels and then God and you had this whole big long uh, uh, chain of creation. And the great chain of being or the ladder of life is something that just permeates the understanding of evolution. We, we even have, have metaphors that, that reflect this. Missing link Chains have links. Uh, the missing link is a link is a missing link on the chain, great chain of being. Um, we have all of these ideas that this sort of reflect this idea of this gradual transition. The second most common question I get on talk radio, which I don't wish on anyone, by the way, especially AM talk radio, PBS, yeah, but not AB, you know, NPR is good, but not not AM radio. The second most common question I get. If man evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? This is great chain of being thinking. How could humans possibly have evolved from monkeys? Because there still are monkeys, and monkeys would have all evolved into humans, right? So there's this really basic misunderstanding of what evolution is out there, even by some people who actually think they accept it. So we have to get people to thinking about evolution as this branching and splitting process, because that's the solution to, to, to doing this. And I suggest a really simple kind of analogy that your students and members of the general public understand already, and that is a family tree. You gotta get them to think about trees instead of chains and ladders. Descent with modification is something they're all familiar with because they have descended with modification, as have all of us, uh, and we all understand the concept of a family tree. My sister Sue and I are the children of Dad. Dad is the son of Grandpa. Grandpa is also the father of Uncle John. Uncle John is the father of Cousin Liz. Sue and I are more similar to each other than we are to Cousin Liz because Sue and I shared a common ancestor in Dad more recently than we shared a common ancestor and grandpa with Liz. But Sue and I and Liz are all more similar to each other than we are to you, although sooner or later we're related to you too, because Sue and I and Liz shared a common ancestor and grandpa more recently than we shared somebody way back when with you. Get across the idea of splitting and branching. Start with something like a family tree, because they understand that. And then you can move very nicely to organisms. Bears and dogs look more like each other than they look like lions, because bears and dogs shared a common caniform ancestor with each other, more recent than they shared a common carnivore ancestor with lions. Cebus and howler monkeys look more like each other than they look like apes, because the monkeys shared a common seaboid ancestor with each other more recently than they shared a common primate ancestor with apes. But bears and monkeys look more like each other than they look like salamanders because carnivores and primates shared a common mammal ancestor more recently than they shared a common vertebrate ancestor with salamanders. The more recently you shared a common ancestor, the more similar you are. That's a really big idea of evolution, but the public isn't getting it at least judging from the calls I get on talk radio. Okay, how we teach, um, oh, uh, speaking of, um, of um, uh, if man evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? The answer to that is that we did not evolve from monkeys. We and monkeys shared a common ancestor. A tree living primate gave rise to, on the one hand, early apes and early monkeys. Early monkeys gave rise to modern monkeys. Early apes gave rise to modern apes and humans. And don't give me a bad time about, but they're all apes, I don't care. When the public hears ape, it thinks chimpanzee. It doesn't think, some, you know, it doesn't think about some Miocene uh, incipient uh, uh, brachiator. It thinks chimps. So, you know, what they hear is more important than what you... Get them to understand this much, and then you can go into the difference between uh, uh, hominines and uh, pongids and stuff like that. Okay, again, how, things that you can teach that will do help a great deal in, ter in terms of helping people understand what evolution is and how it works. 
an idea that is not well accepted in the public, and, and we can thank both the creation science people as well as the intelligent design people for exacerbating the problem, but the basic idea is one that's extant even without a creationist movement, and that is the idea that you can get complex things from simple things. You can get complex things in simple steps. People look at something like a hummingbird or the vertebrate eye and they think, no way that you could get something like that from little tiny weeny steps. No way, that's so incredibly complicated. No way that something like that could have evolved. Body plans are a real big deal in the especially intelligent design literature where they go on and on about how uh, you know, you know that the, the Cambrian explosion was a separate creation of body plans, according to the um, intelligent design and creation science people. Interesting idea. Um, but those body plans that you find of the invertebrates of the Cambrian explosion are too complex. They're too independent. You can't bring them back to each other. Well, try to get people to understand, and you can use body plans, you can also use structures. I'll give you a quick example of each. You can use body plans as a way to kind of try to help people understand this. You know, something like a, a um, jellyfish, the, Nard uh, Nardin the jellyfish, <laughs> Nadarians, Milana, easy for you to say. Uh, two layers, very simple kind of organism. You know, you add a layer and you get something like a flatworm. It's not that big a change. And actually, in evolutionary developmental biology, we're, trying, we're figuring out what the genetic systems for adding layers and adding segments and adding stuff uh, is, and, and it's not that incomprehensible. You can go from very simple things to more complex things in small steps. Add another layer, you get something like a roundworm. Add another layer, you get something like a segmented worm, like a, an annelid. Add a few more layers, and you get something like a chordate. You can go from simple things to something like a chordate. And obviously, the first chordate wasn't nearly as snappy as something like a human or, or any other kind of mammal, any, any vertebrate. Um, simple things can give rise to more complicated things. True of body plans, it's also true of things like complicated structures, and of course, you know, Paley's idea of, of uh, the argument from design is something that is very persuasive to people as a reason to reject evolution. You remember Paley, he's the guy with the heath. You see a rock on the heath, you wouldn't think two things of it, it's a natural occurrence, it's very simple, it could have been there forever. But if you see a watch on the heath, you know there had to be a watchmaker because of the complexity of the watch. Therefore, when you see something like the vertebrate eye, which has, like a watch, um, all these parts that working together accomplish a, a task, in the, either telling time or bringing light to the eye. When you have a complicated structure like the eye, clearly there had to be an eye maker because something as complicated as the eye could have no natural explanation. And of course, underlying this idea, which is, I think, very interesting from a philosophical standpoint, is the idea which was extant certainly in a great deal of the 1700s and 1800s, that nature is chaotic and unformed and disorganized and only intelligence and human beings and God can actually bring order to nature. And of course, this is why Darwin's idea of natural selection was so controversial and so subversive and why over and over and over in On the Origin of Species, he talked about how, how you could explain things like vertebrate eyes. You could explain complex things by step, by step um, uh, incremental changes brought about by natural selection. The real, the real revolution of Darwin's work was coming up with a natural explanation for something which previously had no natural explanation. And this it was the root of a great deal of the theological problems that people have had with natural selection. Well, you know, scientists have postulated uh, how you could evolve something as complicated as the vertebrate eye from a very, very simple beginning, something as simple as a merely um, photosensitive, a light sensitive patch of pigment cells on the surface of the skin. Uh, turn, make a cup out of that, well that would certainly have selective value because you could, you could find out which way the light is coming from, so there would be adaptive value to that. That would tend to increase through time. If you add a lens, things get even better. You all know the story pretty well, etc., etc. Oops, so much for that. I 
wrong order. Oh, well, we'll fix it before we put it on the slide. Um, you all know the story pretty well. You can get from very simple things to very complicated things. And in fact, if you look at living mollusks today, you can see basically that same sequence of a patch of skin with a uh, slight pigmented uh, photosensitive um, a patch on it, which allows you to distinguish light from dark, which is actually pretty important in a lot of biochemical uh, 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 things that go on in, in uh, organisms. Um, that would have adaptive value, and so forth and so on. So you can, um, you, can, uh, uh, you, you can show people that you can get complicated things from very simple beginnings, and that is a basic reason why many people reject evolution. I want to talk a little bit about intermediate fossils, uh, intermediate forms. I want to talk about the fossil record and how we might teach that better also, especially this idea of missing links, transitional fossils. Now, we actually do have very good transitional series for a lot of organisms. The public doesn't know this very well. We have wonderful series of fossils going from an aquatic vertebrate to the first land vertebrates, uh, the um, uh, very uh, primitive lobe fins to the first tetrapods. We've got some great uh, fossils here. Tiktaalik only helped fill in the gap. There's lots and lots and lots of others. I want to talk as an example, though, about whales, because whales are, uh, have such a fabulous fossil record these days, and you can really do so much to actually show the development of whales from land animals. This is kind of a nice example um, because it goes from the water to the land. Well, the whale's story is going from the land to the water, and that's kind of a nice Nice parallel there. Whales evolve from land animals. They evolve specifically from land animals known as artiodactyls, the hooved mammals. This is hard for many people to believe. Um, this is not, you know, intuitive. Most people think of an artiodactyl and they think of a cow and they think, well, now come on, how do you get a whale evolving from a cow? Well, of course, you don't get a whale evolving from a cow. You get a cow is a, like a whale, is a highly evolved uh, modern day animal. And nobody evolves from the modern day. This is like saying, I evolved from my cousin. You know, whales and cows shared a common ancestry eventually back, back when. Lovely uh, data on whales showing the characteristics that um, derive from uh, artiodactyls, not just bone characteristics, but also things like sacculated stomachs and so forth. And of course, the first artiodactyls didn't look like uh, cows either. They were very primitive in their forms. Now, cetaceans, um, it's kind of hard to imagine them evolving from creatures with hooves, but they did. We have a lot of data on how this transition took place. When we look at the very um, early um, uh, creatures, the, the artiodactyls that were sort of leaning toward the uh, whale line, you find that they had very functional pelvis, they were, had weight-bearing pelvis. As you follow along in whale evolution, the pelvis becomes more and more vestigial until finally with modern-day uh, whales it really you know, doesn't uh, support weight whatsoever. You also find a shortening of nasal bones throughout this series. You find the blowholes move from, the, from being nostrils in the early um, artiodactyls up to blowholes on the top of the head. I don't have a slide to show you the dental changes, but there are changes in the teeth. Uh, the very earliest whales, the, the latest artiodactyls, earliest whales, whatever, that, that kind of mushy area as, as the, the split is beginning, show characteristics of um, of either early whales or late artiodactyls. The same thing for the ear bones. You know, whales have very fancy uh, ears that, that are very distinct in mammals. And so we have a lot of information about the evolution of whales. We have now a whole series of what they call walking whales, of whales that um, uh, are early whales. They were not yet um, fully marine. They might have been somewhat amphibious. Some of them were uh, freshwater, some of them were, lack, were uh, marine. And we really have a, a quite fabulous series of fossils now. Now, one of these is a very interesting fossil named Ambulocetus. And uh, this was probably a, um, an amphibious form. It lived on the shore, spent a lot of time in the water. Uh, characteristics of the dentition suggest it probably ate fish. Uh, there's some other things that make, make us believe that this is indeed on the way to, to, uh, to the whale evolution. Ambulocetus was um, 
discovered back uh, in the 90s, actually. Um, and Ambulocetus helped me understand this business of transitional fossils. Back in 1999, I and a number of other uh, evolutionists um, uh, squared off on firing line, remember William F. Buckley, uh, with four supporters of intelligent design, one of whom was Michael Behe. Uh, the biochemist from uh, Lehigh University. And during the course of the um, uh, firing line program, which was this grueling two-hour event under the lights, one of the people that's, uh, I think probably Ken Miller had mentioned, Ambulocetus is this great transitional fossil. What do you mean there are gaps in the fossil record? We have great fossils like Ambulocetus. And uh, one of the um, people on the creationist side, I think it uh, might have been David Berlinski or perhaps um, uh, Phil Johnson said, ah, but, um, So-and-so, famous paleontologist, says Ambulocetus is not an ancestor of whales. <laughs> and we all kind of didn't understand why that was significant, but I, you know, in the hurly-burly of the rush, I kind of let it go. Later on, I was having an email exchange with, um, with uh, Michael Behe. Um, we are civil to one another. I uh, disagree on a lot of stuff, but civility is important. And this idea, this thing about, um, you know, Novacek says that Ambulocetus isn't an ancestor. I said, well, yeah, it's not an ancestor. Well, there, you, there goes your transitional fossil. I said, no, 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 that's not the point. Indeed, Ambulocetus is not on the direct line of whale ancestor. Ambulocetus is not great, great, great granddad whale. He's more like great, great, great uncle. But Ambulocetus tells us a whole lot about whatever the true lineal ancestor of whales living at that time would have looked like. Some of the characteristics of the, of the dentition or of the middle ear or of the position of the uh, nares and so forth. These characteristics were extant in the ancestor of whale even if we don't have that exact fossil. It helped me under understand that in evolutionary biology and paleontology we're talking about transitional structures. We're not talking about great-great-granddad. We're not talking about ancestors, because the vast majority of fossils we have are not ancestors. They are not on that direct lineal line of descent. So I started talking about different kinds of relatives. You know, you go back to, um, well, never mind. You, you go back to the idea of that family tree, uh, dad, me, dad, grandpa, and great-grandpa. This is my lineal kin, as we say in the anthropology. Biz. We have lineal kin that are direct ancestors. We also have collateral kin, okay? We also have uncles and aunts, and we have cousins, and we have great uncles and great aunts, and we have second cousins. We have all these collateral kin that are not on the direct line of ancestry. But you know, if I didn't have a picture of my great grandpa, but I had a picture of my great great, two greats, if I had a picture of my great great uncle, who's my great grandpa's dad, uh, brother, that would tell me a little bit, yeah, well, you know, probably great-grandpa was tall because my great-great-uncle is tall. He had red hair. You know, grandpa might have had red hair. I could still learn something about my lineal ancestor, even if I only had a collateral ancestor. And that's why Ambulocetus is important and all the other creatures that show transitional structures because it's really the structure that matters rather than the ancestry itself. So try to break yourself of talking about ancestors because we actually have very good fossil records. This drawing is not terribly accurate because it shows creatures like uh, Pachycetus and Ambulocetus as being on the direct line. They really aren't. They're, they're, they're cousins. They're sidelines. And in fact, Neil Shubin got it absolutely right when he was talking about Tiktaalik. He said, this is our branch. You're looking at your great, 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 great cousin. And that's what most of the fossils really are. I'm going to leave you with a last thought, which is that Dobzhansky was right. You all know the famous quote from the American biology teacher, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Now, what does that mean? I would encourage you to teach your students what Dobzhansky was talking about. Because what he was talking about here, as he said inside the article, he said, seen in the light of evolution, Biology is perhaps intellectually the most satisfying and inspiring science. Without that light, it becomes a pile of sundry facts, some of them interesting or curious, but making no meaningful picture as a whole. What Dobzhansky was talking about when he said evolution makes sense of biology is he was saying that because of common ancestry, 
Biology is the way it is, instead of some other way. Why do all tetrapods have one bone here, two bones here, a bunch of little bones here, and a spray of bones here? It's because all tetrapods are descended from the first tetrapod that had one bone here and two bones here and a bunch of little bones here and a spray of bones here. Why do all tetrapods have four legs? There's nothing magical about being a land animal and having four eggs, legs. Insects have six legs. Arachnids have eight legs. There's nothing, you know, special. We don't have any three-legged creatures, but, you know, there's nothing special about four. It's because tetrapods are descended from four-legged aquatic vertebrates. And when you think about it, two limbs in front and two limbs in back is kind of the minimal number you need if you're going to locomote in a three-dimensional uh, environment like water. Forward, backward, left, right, up and down. You kind of need two in front and two in back. That's why land vertebrates have four legs. Common ancestry tells you why things are like they are instead of some other way. Wouldn't it have been fun if we had been descended from six-legged aquatic vertebrae? Think of how much more, we're in a basketball stadium here, think of how much more fun basketball would have been if we had four sets of arms. But that's not the way evolution worked. And we have four limbs, two legs and two, two feet, because we are land vertebrates, and all land vertebrates have four limbs. Biology makes sense of evolution in this very special way of telling you why things are like they are rather than another way. My friend uh, Bill Thwaites, who's a biochemist, once commented from a biochemist standpoint, if you've seen one you carry out, you've seen them all. Um, that's a real knee slapper for biologists, but, um, but it's true, you know, I mean, because the, the biochemical processes that we use for, for um, getting energy and processing energy and all that were developed very, very early in evolutionary history and all of us organisms on, on Earth uh, uh, inherited it. So if you teach your students that evolution makes sense of biology in this fashion, they will learn very quickly that number one, biology makes more sense. It's, it holds together as a coherent science, not just a pile of sundry facts, as, as Dobzhansky said. But they'll also understand why, bio, why evolution is so important. I would like to uh, tell you about the National Center for Science Education. You can go to our website, which is ncseweb.org. If you go to this um, news alert uh, section here, you can sign up for our Friday uh, e-newsletter which uh, has wonderful depressing information about what's going on in the creation and evolution controversy. If you go to this news page, you will be taken to a page where you can um, so sort by state or you can sort by year, find out what's going on in your state or an accompanying state. Uh, obviously, you can also join because it is a membership organization and I would encourage you to do so. My staff uh, consists of very hardworking and wonderful people, Glenn Branch, who does that Friday e-newsletter, and he does a superb job, my deputy director. Louise Mead is our education outreach person. She's here at these meetings. Watch for her. She and her colleagues in the education committee did a wonderful uh, uh, workshop today for local science teachers. Eric Mickle is one of our flare-ups wranglers. Uh, theologian Peter Hess is our faith outreach uh, staff member. Uh, Josh Rosenau is another one of our flare-ups wranglers. Uh, and our geologist, Stephen Newton, and uh, our Anton Mates, uh, another flare-ups wrangler. Alas, like Nick Motsky, we're losing him to graduate school. And uh, those of you in Oregon will be getting a really smart young man, and we will definitely miss him. And obviously, for those of you on Facebook, uh, we are an up-to-date organization, and you can join and see us on Facebook as well. And even though I haven't been on The Simpsons like Stephen Jay Gould, I have been Simpsonized. Thank you so much for this wonderful award and for being so patient to listen to me rant at you for an hour. Thanks so much. Dr. Scott has graciously agreed to answer questions if anyone has any. The question had to do with the relationship between methodological naturalism and naturalism. Philosophical naturalism is not the same thing. Scientists, whether they are theists or not believers, all restrict themselves to natural causes. And it's not because we're all a bunch of atheists. 
it's because it works. We are a very practical lot, scientists are. The creationists will argue that, in fact, the, this isn't new with Ham and Sarfati either. I mean, this goes back to Henry Morris. They have always argued that, well, the facts are the same, we just have a different interpretation. But when you look at what they do to the facts and how they carefully ignore the facts that don't agree with them, you know, we can still talk about the facts. But as far as the nature of science stuff, it's the intelligent design people who have been most vociferous about abandoning methodological naturalism. They have what they call theistic science, which is the argument that you should be able to bring in God as an explanation for certain aspects of science, which they think are, they say are different from all other science. Your general lab work, you know, your general field work, your general science, that's operational science. You just use regular natural causes. But origin science, in other words, the things that have uh, religious uh, significance for them. Origin science, you're supposed to be allowed to bring in God to be the, the direct creator. Like I say, the, the argument for leaving God out is that we can't test explanations using God. God is unconstrained. How do you hold constant God's efforts? If you can't hold constant God's efforts, you can't possibly test uh, God as an explan explainer. Any outcome of your test is compatible with God's actions. The corn grew higher, God wanted it to grow higher. The corn didn't grow high, God didn't want it to grow high. You're not going to get very far in understanding the natural world. So whether you are a believer or not a believer, you leave God out of your science. And you know, it works really, really well. Uh, my friend Robert Pennock, I love to quote him on this, uh, came up with, a, I think, a very wise uh, statement in uh, one of his books. He said, to say nothing of God is not to say that God is nothing. But God, as an explanator, as a part of your scientific explanation, does not improve science. In fact, it weakens it. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful event, a wonderful occurrence. I am I'm extremely proud to be your first Stephen Jay Gould recipient, and I thank you for recognizing efforts to bring science to the people. Thanks so much.